Thanks for being patient with me. Um, had ACL surgery a couple weeks ago, and I'm on the mend now. Uh, tore it doing the sports that I love, and uh, had surgery, and you know, hoping to continue to heal and get better. And so far, so good. Um, this week, I had physical therapy for the first time, and you know, the therapist was asking, "Hey, what are some of the things that we want to accomplish here? What do you want to, you know, what do you want to do? What are some of the benchmarks we're aiming at?" And I said, "Well, you know, I love these sports. I've been doing them my entire life. I'd love to get back to it." And she's like, "Oh, okay. You know, like that's a that's a great idea." Um, but that is a goal. But then I was like, "You know what? I've got a more immediate goal that I'd love to hit uh, sooner than later." Last week we had um, some new families here, and. I was really excited about that, and I, you know, I'm cr crutching my way over to grab some gum from my wife real quick, and then, and then they took off, and, and I was trying to catch up with them. So I was telling the physical therapist, like, okay, here's, a, you know, here's an immediate goal I'd love to do. I'd love to get quick enough that I can catch our first-time visitors. So I don't know if they've ever heard a goal like that before, but that's where I'm at. Do me a favor, track down a Bible if you can, and get with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And in the Bibles we have in baskets down by your feet, you'd find that on page 976. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, you'd find on page 976. We're starting a new series now. It's called Game Changer. And what we're, what we're acknowledging is that God has given us certain things that, that when we engage in them, when we bring them on, when we onboard them as a part of our life, it, it has the opportunity to change us. Uh, it has the opportunity to, to really change the dynamic of the way that we live out our Christian faith. Uh, my daughter, Reese, was doing, um, she was doing soccer recently, and, and it was, you know, I'm not even sure how many games they played or how many weeks it was, but, you know, she's six years old, so when we first started, it was kind of like you're just watching all these, you know, the, a mob of kids, like, chasing a ball around. And I, you know, I was out for that week when I had the surgery, but then I watched her this week, and... I guess they had a practice with the parents, and something changed in her. Like, she figured it out, and she was apparently elbowing one of the moms, and then she scored the goal, the only goal of the day. But there was this game-changing, apparently this game-changing moment that happened for her because she figured it out, and all of a sudden, she was just doing awesome. And so when I watched her game on, on Thursday night, I was like, wow, babe, you, you are really good at soccer. And, and it was really impressive. And here's, here's the point. There are certain things that God has given for us that when we engage in them, they can change us. And sometimes we call them spiritual disciplines or habits of grace or rhythms of the gospel rhythms, whatever you, we want to call them. God has given us certain things that when we leverage them, when we embrace them, when we make them a part of our routine, they do change us and they help us to know God better. There are several different groups who have done studies. There, there's Pew Research and Lifeway Research and um, Leadership Network and the Reveal Study and the MOVE um, findings from the Reveal Study. And here's what they did. They asked a bunch of Christians who were mature and growing in their, in their spirituality, they said, what are some of the things that you do what are some of your habits? What are some of the rhythms of your life? And in all these different studies, the same list of items kind of rose to the surface. There are things that Christians who are growing statistically are all engaged in, and there are things that wouldn't surprise you, things like Bible reading. People who are growing spiritually are ordinarily, you know, people who are going to open up a Bible and read it with some kind of regularity, that they believe that God can speak to them, so they've made reading this on their own a habit of their life. Things like prayer, um, things like spending time with God, communicating with him, sharing the concerns of their heart, or just really talking to him. And Christians who learn how to do that, it changes their life. And there are other ones as well, like serving and fasting and solitude and all kinds of different stuff that, show, that will show up on those sorts of lists. But the one I want to talk to you about today is this idea of worship. And I'm not just talking about singing songs. I'm talking about this posture, this way of life, where when Christians learn how to become worshipful people in every place that we go, at all times, God will leverage that to help us know him better and better. In fact, I think that's really the goal of Christianity, that we are supposed to be a people who know God and relate to him in this worshipful way all of the time. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, the first question on there 
was, it goes like this. What's the chief end of mankind? What, what is it that we're made for? And the answer to that question is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So what I'm suggesting isn't a novel idea. It's something that people have noticed throughout the history of Christianity. One of the things that God wants us to understand is he has made us as worshipers and he wants us to become a worshipful people. And that means that we're going to learn, I'm, I've been praying this week, that we would learn how to expand our category of worship, that it becomes something that we kind of march out of church this morning and we say, okay, I'm going to continue worshiping throughout the course of the week, wherever it is God takes me. I'm going to become a full-time worshiper. And so that's what we're looking at this morning in Hebrews 13. So let's go ahead and read the text. We'll pray and we'll get to work. We're in Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16. And it reads like this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let's pray. Lord, we commit this time to you. And we pray right now with Bibles open before us and hearts open to you, we pray that your spirit, God, would help us to become full-time worshipers. And that's really how you've wired us to begin with. We all are unceasing worshipers, but God, we want to worship in a way that's pleasing to you. We want the priorities of our hearts and our lives to be synced up with what you're doing. And we want to be people who, no matter what's going on in life, that we are people who are acknowledging your worth and, and, and just being thankful for the salvation that we have and that our lives are being conformed more and more to what you want for us, God. But I do believe this is a game-changing habit. So help us, God, to expand this category of worship and help us to become a worshiping people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to find here the how of worship, the what of worship, and the why of worship. We're going to see here that in Hebrews, these two short verses here, they help us to understand worship as a way of life. And um, let's, let's go ahead and get after it. The how of worship is right there on the front end. It's, we're being told the how of worship is that we worship God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's in verse 15. So let's, let's look at it. It says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Now let's work our way backwards through that sentence so we can figure out what's going on here. Sacrifice of praise. That's where I'm getting the idea of worship. We are supposed to be a people who are offering something to God, and here it's being described as this sacrifice of praise. We're supposed to thank God for what he has done, and it is supposed to be this sacrificial expression. Now, a part of the human experience is the fact that if there is a God, one of the questions that every person wrestles with is how am I supposed to relate to that God? If there's a maker, if there's a creator, and I was built and intended to be in a relationship with him, what would he require from me for that relationship to be healthy? What are the necessary sacrifices that I'd have to make? What would God want from me in order to have that friendship with him? Now that question looms in the background of, I think, every human heart. Everyone is trying to process that, whether we articulate it in that way or not. But in the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Jewish and the Christian history, we have answers for that. Because God has spoken and he's told us, yes, I have made you. Yes, I am a holy God and there is a way to approach me. And so if you read the Old Testament, what do you find? You find a whole system, a sacrificial system that's designed to help people understand there's a holy God and we need some kind of help to be able to come into contact with him. So people would bring these offerings to him, these sacrifices and, and God explained, here's what that looks like. You bring these animals, you bring it to this location, to the tabernacle or the, the temple, and certain people have a, a job of receiving those sacrifices, and all of that's supposed to help you understand that you are relating to, you are approaching a holy God. And so 
as we talk about this sacrifice of praise, we're wondering, okay, what, what does that look like then? How is it that we can come before a holy God and interact with him in a way that would be pleasing to him? And this text gives us some answers that helps us to understand. God has made us, and we are made to be worshiping people, and he has given us a prescription to come into his presence and to worship him with our entire existence. So there's a sacrifice of praise. We're to be a worshiping people. We are to worship continually. You see that phrase there, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise. So that means that worship isn't just Sunday mornings. It isn't just when you go to a religious experience. Worship becomes this big concept that now hijacks your entire life. It's a continual experience. It's ongoing. That means that we are constantly worshiping. Harold Best, he, uh, he, he wrote a book called Unceasing Worshippers, and he talks about the fact that this is how God made us. We just are worshipers. Now, the question we need to ask is, are we worshiping the right stuff? Are we worshiping God? Are we aligning our hearts to the reality that God you know, made us and created us and wants us to relate to him? So we are continually worshiping. Now, some of you guys, you're way more musical than I am. You like musicals, which I don't. And you might think, huh, that's kind of cool, right? It's like, it's like a musical. So what you're describing is, I just walk around, I sing on Sunday morning, which feels kind of normal at church, uh, but you're saying, like, I just get to walk around and break out into song? Um, like, I, I can see my daughter loving that kind of stuff. And, and the answer is yes and no. Christians are people who it is kind of like your life becomes a musical because we're a singing people. And you begin to learn how to express your gratitude to God in song, and that can show up in any place that you go. But it's more than that. Worship is more than merely singing. Worship becomes this posture of the, of the heart where you are continually acknowledging God's goodness and his, his grace toward you, his saving work in your life, no matter where you are going. So this week, you know, I'm driving to, to physical therapy. And when, when, this is, when this is, you know, a reality in my heart, it's like I'm going to worship, right? And it's going to hurt. Like you, some of you guys came up to me this morning, you said, how's physical therapy? hurts, right? And it's going to hurt. But anywhere where I would go as an unceasing worshiper, as someone who is continually worshiping God, it's the environment of that worship experience. We need to become people, this is a game-changing concept, but a people who are constantly worshiping. So tomorrow morning when you're heading off to work, you are heading to worship. You're, com- you're worshiping while you're commuting. When you arrive at work, you could be worshiping while you're there. Your whole life now becomes this expression of worship. And when Christians learn to do this, I do think it changes everything. When we realize that God wants us to be unceasing worshipers who are continually offering to him a sacrifice of praise. Now keep backing up in that sentence there. What do you find? You find an important word. It's therefore. And as I've told you before, and here's what I've learned, whenever you find a therefore, you need to figure out what it's there for. Okay, so when the Bible says, therefore, it's connecting ideas. There's something, you're, you're, you're going to be an unceasing worshiper, you're going to continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, but it's connected to something else. There's a therefore. Now here's what the therefore points to. It points to the gospel. We are unceasing worshipers who are offering the sacrifices of praise to God in a way that's pleasing to him as a response to the good news of what God has done. In fact, if you back up and you look at the, the, the paragraph right before what we're reading, you find this concept. And, and the writer to the Hebrews, he's writing to the Israelite people, and he's saying, look, we have this system where people would bring sacrifices to the high priest, and the high priest would do all these different things, and that's how you would relate to God. You would bring your sacrifice, and he'd be pleased with it if you did it according to his standards. But here's what he says. Jesus went outside the city gates and died as our sacrifice. I mean, just look at verse 12. This is what it says. So Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. The real sacrifice, the whole system, was pointing to this reality that Jesus Christ is the sacrificial offering. 
He's the one who died in our place. He's the love of God on display where God said, yes, I'm going to make a people holy. I'm a holy God and I'm going to make a way for people to come into a friendship with me that's going to last for all of eternity. And it is through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. So when we worship and our life becomes this expression of worship, it is in response to the good news of the gospel. It's in response to what God has done for us in the sending of his son, his, his willingness to have his son bear the, the penalty and the punishment for sin. And then by his blood to make us holy. So we worship God nonstop, but we worship in response to what God has done. So we become a people who are very grateful and thankful. We should be thanking God no matter what, continually, no matter how hard life may seem. Knowing some of your stories, I know that this concept is hard. How do you worship God when things are broken? How do you worship God when things aren't going the way that you expected? It's through faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Knowing that one day he's going to make all things new again, but you can currently worship God wherever it is that you go in response to the good news of the gospel of what God has done for you when he sent his son to die in your place. All right, lastly, you see this through Jesus. You see the importance of that first little phrase there in verse 15. That means that what we do as unceasing worshipers is we worship God through faith in Jesus Christ. Everything that we do now goes through him. It's through what he has done for us that we learn to be this worshiping people. We place our faith in him for our salvation. Now we live by faith in him and everything that we do then is made holy by his finished work on the cross. And we worship God then through faith in Jesus Christ or not at all, but this is a concept where all of life then becomes worship. So that means that obviously we come together on Sunday mornings. We shouldn't neglect to do that. In chapter 10, it puts it like this. Do not neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as, as you see the day approaching. We're supposed to come together on Sunday mornings or whenever the case might be and worship together and sing together. But all of that is meant to propel us out into the world and to propel us into our ordinary lives. And we just continue worshiping God throughout the course of the week. When we learn to, to make that a habit or a routine of our lives, I think that changes us. The second thing that we find here in the text is the what. So here's, here's the next question. What would it look like to live this out? So yes, I want to become an unceasing worshiper. I want you guys all to be worshiping God unceasingly. But what would that actually look like? And, and it's described for us in verses 15 and 16. We worship God by acknowledging Christ and then syncing our lives up to the beauty of what it's like to live in harmony with God. So let's look at it. It gives us a few different expressions of what, what worship would look like. The first thing it says is, when we are unceasing worshipers, one of the things that we do is we talk about it. We talk about it. We profess, we acknowledge, we, we speak about our Savior, Look at verse 15. So this um, sacrifice of praise is the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. That means we, we use our, our lips and our mouths to talk about Jesus Christ and the salvation that we have in him. We tell people about it. It's not something that we hide from people. So, so we talk about it. That's a part, part of our worship. And I understand that Christians have misused this before. In fact, they've, there are some Christians that we might think about who, who we would say they've done it in such a distasteful way. They've been so open about their faith in a way that's actually off-putting to the watching world, and we kind of reacted to that. We say, yeah, we've, you know, there are crazy Christians out there who they're going around and they're talking about it, but they're doing it in such an abrasive way that I don't think anyone wants anything to do with it. So what do we do? We go the complete opposite direction. We say, I'm not going to talk about my faith. I'm not going to share with my coworkers about Jesus Christ as my Lord. I'm going to keep that to myself. If they ask about it, I might share openly, but, but th my strategy is going to be, I'm going to keep this pretty private because I don't want anyone to be rubbed wrong by it. Now, Hebrews 13 is here to remind us part of, of worship, part of what's required of us is to be able to use our mouths to talk openly about our Savior. 
We need to be able to have the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. We need to be people who are unashamed to let other people know this is the most significant thing about us. We are a redeemed people. We have a savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He has rescued us. And we need to begin to talk about that. We can think of examples in scripture where people failed to do this. Think about Peter when Jesus was arrested and he was, um, he was close enough that he could watch things unfold as the uh, trial was happening and, and people began to notice him and he was sitting around warming himself by a fire and multiple people come up to him and say, hey, aren't you his follower? Aren't you with him? Surely you are. Your accent gives you away. And what does he do? I don't know the guy. I don't know him. He denies him. And I think some of us, by our silence on, on this subject, we are denying Christ. I, I hope that nobody would ever find out at your work that you're a Christian and be absolutely floored by it. I hope that people wouldn't go, I had no idea. I've been working with you for a decade. I had no idea you were a Christian. You've never talked about it. I hope that we become people who, who, who are willing to say, I'm going to acknowledge my Lord and Savior. That's a part of my worship experience. I want other people to know him. So I'm going to confess him as Lord. Another aspect of worshiping is that we should be people who are seeking to do good. Look at verse 16. And do not forget to do good. The way that we live should actually look like an experience of living in harmony with God. We should be living our lives and making choices and decisions in a way that actually communicates the goodness of God. Um, It kind of makes me think about, you know, when a when a song comes on that you that you like, that a song comes on and you kind of hear you you hear the beat and then you hear the melody, you hear the lyrics, and you can't help but you know tapping your foot and then you're nodding your head and then you're you're moving your body and then maybe you're singing along. I think that's what it should feel like when a Christian shows up. When When we show up, it should be this beautiful expression of people who are doing good, who are living in harmony with God, and it should feel like a really, really good song just came on because we are not forgetting to do good. We are living in harmony with God. We're living in the power of the Spirit of God. We're living with the fruit of that spiritual reality. We're, we're loving, and we're kind, and we're gentle, and we're patient, and we're joyful, and we have self-control, and we're doing that. So when we show up, man, I hope that when you arrive at work, people aren't like, oh, they're here, right? Hopefully, it feels like Jesus just showed up, that people kind of feel like, oh, they're here, and they can't help but respond to the beauty of your life because you're not forgetting to do good. You're worshiping God in a way where it's translating into my life is beginning to display the goodness of God. Now, the question we need to ask then is how do, you, how do we know what good is? How would we know what good would look and feel like? And I think that would, that would mean we're, we become people who read our Bibles and we're thinking through, what does this mean for me? Right? Christianity can't just be something, it can't just be ideas I want it to be something that radically changes me. I want to do good. There's stuff that God wants for me in response to the salvation that I've experienced, and I want my life to begin to display that. I want people who come into contact with me to feel like they're coming in contact with something good. Now, it'll be imperfect. I know that for sure, but I want my life to be lining up to the standards that God has given to us. I hope that people aren't saying, yeah, they're very involved at church, but they are selfish jerks, right? I hope your neighbors would never say that about you or your coworkers or anybody that, that is able to come that close to you, that they know what it's really like to be around you. Hopefully they're feeling like this person is committed to doing good and my life is improved because of my proximity to them. I hope that's what they feel. So do not forget to do good. And, and then there's another element to our worship. It's being generous, if we're worshiping God, it should show up in how we handle our stuff. Verse 16, share with others. There's a, there's an, a reality about our worship that actually shows up in how we handle things. So our resources and our time and our energy and our possessions, all of a sudden when we're worshiping God, 
There's, there's a new priority. We're, we should be thinking through, how can I leverage this for the good of other people? How can I share with other people? That's a part of worshiping God. It shows up in my care for other people. And I, and I, I get really worried on this one because I know that in our society, it's way too easy to, be, to have no margin. No margin in our resources, no margin in our time. We, we, we fill everything up to the point where we can't share with other people. We don't have anything left to share. I think we need to simplify and create some margin so that we can do things like hospitality, so that we can share our possessions with other people. We can open our lives to neighbors and strangers, and we can invite them in, and they can experience something of the goodness of God. That's a part of our worship experience. We need to be a people who are sharing, who are, who are thinking through, how does your life better other people? And that's a radical shift in the way that we think. I mean, so often we're just trying to do stuff for us and for our immediate family. We need to begin to think through, how can my existence improve other people's experience? I want to share with other people. That's worship. Now, finally, we see the why here at the end. We get the motivation for this commitment to this game-changing habit of allowing worship to be an all-of-life category. And the why is that we should be motivated to worship God because it is pleasing to Him. God is pleased when we say, I want my Christianity to show up in everything. I want my Christianity to be this ongoing encore. I meet with my church family on Sunday mornings, and we worship, and we sing. But I also want that worship to continue throughout the course of the week, and I do that because it's pleasing to God. God looks at my life, and, he, and here's what I want. I want him to look at it and say, with that, I'm well pleased. And here's the unfortunate part. It is possible to, to not please him. If we can please him, look at the end of verse 16. With such sacrifices, God is pleased. Here's the, the, the opposite implication. It is, it's possible then to, to offer sacrifices with which God is not pleased. There are things that we can do that might look really spiritual and really worshipful and really pious and all these different things, but if we are not doing it in the way that God has given to us, the, the Bible over and over again in many places talks about how we can go through the motion of religious activity and God is not pleased. Let me give you just one example. There are many, but in Malachi chapter 1, Verse 10, the prophet is speaking and he's talking to the people of God and he's talking about all the sacrifices that they're making and all the worship experiences that they're engaged in. And here is the assessment. He says, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. Here's, here's that phrase. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. And I will, I will accept no offering from your hands. God here, in this case, they're doing all these different things and God looks at it and he assesses it and he says, I'm not happy with this. I am not pleased with this. And he, so, so for me, I'm wondering, okay, how do we worship God in a way that is pleasing? What would we need to do to ensure that when we are living our lives in a posture of worship, that God is looking on that and saying, with that, I am well pleased. I'm... You know, I want, I want to be careful here of throwing stones because I live in a glass house, but I wonder in the final assessment of things, how many worship services conducted by churches God might look at and say, actually, I'm not very pleased with this. I'm not very satisfied with how everything is organized here. I'm not very happy. And I wonder how many, you know, lives of individual Christians God would look at. So my question is, how can we know that God is pleased? How can we be motivated so that our lives sync up with this gospel agenda of ongoing worship and we can know God is pleased with us? And I think we find the answer here in the text. We're, we're, we're asking what's the difference between this worship that is pleasing and this worship that is not pleasing to God? And the answer, I think, is here in our section, but we're also given a little clue in the previous chapter. We're given a little clue about the difference 
between something that pleases God and something that does not please God. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. Here's what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. There it is. That's the thing that differentiates between pleasing and unpleasing. Without this thing called faith, it is impossible to please God. It can look great. You can be engaged in this thing that everyone else would evaluate as spiritual and worshipful and all of that. But without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So faith is the thing that we're after. We want our worship to be marked by faith. Okay, that brings us full circle. We're back at the very beginning of these two verses. What is the object that we're placing our faith in that makes our worship acceptable? It's Jesus. We are placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ so that through him, we are offering this ongoing sacrifice of praise. It is our faith in him that makes our life and our sacrifice pleasing to God. With such sacrifices, God is pleased. When you determine that you're going to allow your entire life to be a worship service, and you say that the way that you're going to accomplish that is through faith in Jesus Christ, God looks at that and he says, with that, I am well pleased. Harrison, my four-year-old, he'll, he'll ask Ash and I, he'll say, are you happy at me? And, you know, that's four-year-old, that's, that's a phrase that, only, you know, typically only four-year-olds will say, you know, are you, are you happy at me? And that's the question that we all are asking of God. What is the sacrifice that would be pleasing to God? God, are you happy at us? Are, are you, do you, do you love us? Do you accept us? Do you receive us as we are? And the answer to that, according to the Bible, according to what we're looking at this morning is, if we are placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and if we are adopting this game-changing reality of living a life of worship for him through faith in Jesus Christ, God is pleased. He looks at us. He looks at what we're doing. It's not going to be perfect, but he's looking at that, that reality of faith. And he's saying, with that, I am well pleased. So here's what I'm praying we would do. I'm praying that we would become unceasing worshipers of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, I do think it changes everything. So I'm going to invite the band to come and we're going to worship once more. But let's, let's just remind ourselves of what we're saying. God is pleased when the rhythms and the routines of our life become this, this, this expression of worship when we allow this gospel agenda to inform everything that we do, when we begin to think about Christianity expanding beyond the bounds of a Sunday morning hour, and we begin to see that this is an all-of-life category, and we worship God, we continually offer ourselves to God, openly professing his name, seeking to live beautifully before a watching world, sharing with other people who are in need. And when we do all of that from a posture of faith, in the Son of God who loved us and died for us. When we do that, God is pleased. So would you stand with me, please, and we'll pray, and then we will worship. God, for all of us, would you help us to recognize that worship is such a huge category. Singing is a part of it, but, but man, we want, we want our lives to be an ongoing encore. Help us to worship you nonstop this week. Wherever it is that we go, whatever challenges we might face, help us to worship you. Help our lives to be an expression of beauty and goodness and generosity. Help us to profess Jesus as Lord. God, help us to have faith in the Son of God who loved us and died for us so that we could be made holy. Let us worship, please. We pray in his name. Amen.